rush hour in Washington, D.C. Commuters must choose between traffic jams or taking the train. One of the train systems serving the Maryland suburbs is known as the Mark Train. Eastbound routes from Brunswick approach Washington through the suburb of Silver Spring. This line also carries one of the country's busiest long-distance express trains, the Capital Limited, westbound Washington to Chicago. At 5.20 p.m. on February 16, 1996, the Capital Limited was preparing to depart. Its regular single daily run is still in the timetable today. 164 passengers boarded on the day in question. The travelers settled into their seats. Those going all the way to Chicago were looking at an 18 and a half hour journey. There was no reason to feel unsafe. The dinner menu occupied their attention as the express train gradually gathered speed. Mark Train 286 was a train like this, with single-deck passenger cars. On February 16th, there were only 20 passengers, many of them co-workers, returning to Washington after a training course. Many were tired after a long day, the train rocking them almost to sleep. But they were on a collision course with an express train at a closing speed of 70 miles an hour. A passenger train derailed. From the first call, emergency response teams feared the worst. And it's on fire, you say? Yes. Okay, we're on the way for that. Neighbors couldn't believe the scene that was unfolding. I was, you know, looking out the window, the first thing I seen was just like train on top of train, fire, uh, smoke everywhere. Eleven passengers were killed. Some were crushed on impact. Others suffered a more terrible death, trapped inside the marked train, doors jammed shut, the windows unbreakable. It was just burning, twisted, uh, you know, uh, was kids screaming. It was a very eerie scene, you know, kids coming in and out of smoke, banging on the window itself. A diesel tank on the express train had sheared off and burst, spraying fuel inside the marked train. I just jumped on the train and started kicking the windows and jumped down and tried to get rocks and threw at the windows. It would not break. This glass is impossible to break. Images of the disaster were on TV within minutes. As soon as I saw it on television, I knew I needed to respond. It was pretty clear as soon as we arrived on scene that the two trains hit each other at a crossover, a junction between tracks. In a situation like that, the, your first response is that there is a signal's failure. What color signal was being displayed at the crucial moment? The answer was 700 miles away. Washington's signal system is run from a control room in Jacksonville, Florida. We determined that the signal system had functioned properly. It had displayed the proper signal for the Amtrak train was coming toward that signal and then going from one track to another track on a crossover. The Mark train uh, had a stop signal and he was supposed to have stopped in advance of the crossing. Investigators looked for any clue that might help explain the driver's actions. 
we considered that the weather could have been a factor because it was in fact snowing, maybe you couldn't see the signal. After talking with other engineers that had been in the area, um, we decided that the weather was not a factor either. All the fatalities were on the Mark train, including the driver and two crew members in the cab with him. For investigators, it was now pure detective work, but without the key witnesses. Again and again, investigators tried to relive the last few moments of Mark Train 286. What had the driver actually seen? First, a yellow warning signal, meaning prepare to stop at the next set of lights, two miles further down the track. Then, a stop at Kensington to pick up passengers. But why had the driver accelerated after a warning of danger ahead? This is what he saw approaching a blind bend at 60 miles an hour. Suddenly a signal showing red. The driver immediately hit the brakes. As a last desperate measure, he threw the train motor into reverse. But with this much track remaining, it was too late to stop. Confused and frustrated, and determined to discover why these trains crashed, investigators could only guess at the cause. But why, when the means of finding an answer are already available? By law, black box data recorders have been installed on all U.S. trains since 1996. They give a complete technical breakdown of a train's last journey and often provide vital evidence in piecing together events leading up to an accident. Of course, the black box must survive the immense forces unleashed when trains collide. This impact test simulates a head-on crash at 80 miles an hour. The steel casing must protect the delicate components inside. But that isn't the only factor in disasters like Silver Spring. The box is placed in a furnace designed to match the intense heat of a train fire, nearly 2,000 degrees for an hour. If the data is still readable after this abuse, the recorder is considered crashworthy. Data from the recorder in the marked train was anxiously examined in the hope it would provide the critical breakthrough. You can tell when the engineer is applying brakes, when he's changing speeds on the train. We looked at the train equipment itself and we found no problems with any of those things. You're reduced to trying to figure out why an experienced engineer, familiar with the territory, familiar with that particular run would disregard a signal. He's supposed to maintain a speed of no greater than 30 miles an hour prepared to stop. In fact, he got his speed as high as 66 miles an hour. What could have been the fatal distraction? No. Drivers deal with constant radio traffic from the control room and other trains. Records reveal that the conversation moments before the collision had to do with snowballs. There's some kids on the side of the track throwing snowballs at the train. So he contacts an oncoming Mark train, tells him that, watch out, there are some kids along the side of the track throwing snowballs. In the confusion, did the driver even see the yellow warning signal, then call it out to the conductor beside him as the rules require? We believe he called it out. We believe that he probably called it out correctly. Had we had a recording device that recorded voice, um, that would have captured those conversations. We would have known exactly what was said. Why can't they be sure? There's a surprising loophole in the safety law that prevents the black box from being fully effective. Cockpit voice recorders often explain why planes crash, 
Why not when trains crash? There are two problems with the voice recorders in the view of industry and labor. The crew are in a train up to 12 hours a day, day in, day out. There are many times that they have just general conversations, personal, private, whatever. And the concern is that this information would be used to charge the employee for certain violations of railroad regulations. Now the industry side would have a concern because if I am injured in an accident and I have access to this recorder and here we have hours of chatting about the baseball game or a football game, you can see how that would play in front of a jury. If I were a rail manager, I would certainly have concern about it. In the U.S., voice recorders top the wish list for accident investigators. This loophole in the law may mean the cause of these deaths will forever remain an unsolved mystery, and so will the causes of other disasters in the future.